Okay, so let's go slow. There are a couple of things that I want to break down for you. One of them being magnetars. And I want to go into some depth with this so that when this topic comes up again, you will have a much better understanding of the thing. One of the things that astro scientists always point out to everyone is that their intent in studying the universe is to better understand how the universe and everything in it was formed. And I'm telling you, they are struggling. Only so much information comes from the other side, but people tend to be pretty good at engineering things, probably the creator in them. So in following their studies, we should remain at ease because much of what they study is based on theory and the best evidence they have available now. With that said, I'm going to try and be as accurate as possible with my numbers and dates and relay that to you in a absorbable fashion. I don't know why anyone would ever want to leave Earth. Space seems like a very, very unforgivable place. Violent and powerful beyond anyone's imagination. And we are going to take a look at just how powerful as we explore the mighty Magnetar. Before we get into this, I just want to give you our location in space so that you have some sort of visual reference as we go along. So first, we do not have the capability to see the entire universe, but what we can see, we call that the observable universe, which means we can only see as far as the furthest oldest light. And it is believed that the age of this light source is about 13.8 billion years old. So now scientists can look in every direction in space that is 13.8 billion light years away to see if there is anything else that is older. That would put us inside a sphere of about 28 billion light years in diameter. And if you consider inflation at a constant rate, that would actually make it 92 billion light years in diameter, okay? Inside the observable universe, inside this sphere, there's anywhere between 200 billion to 2 trillion galaxies. Nobody really knows, but the Milky Way galaxy is somewhat located in the center of this sphere because it is from our point of observation. Now, the Milky Way galaxy is a barred spiral galaxy, which means in the center, it is compressed and spread out like a bar with four arms coming off the bar in a spiral motion. We have the Norma and Cygnus arm, Sagittarius, Scutum Crux, and Perseus arms. In between the Sagittarius arm and the Perseus arm, there is a small arm coming off of the Sagittarius arm called the Orion Spur. And it is within this spur where our sun and solar system is located. So now that you have some idea of where we might be in the universe, because quite frankly, we seem to be lost in space, I at least want you to have some idea in your head of the scale and positioning of the objects in question, magnetars. You see, when organizations like NASA present this stuff to you, they tend to leave some information out, which I don't blame them for because there is way too much information to cover and it is not information that everyone will understand. It is just up to us to dig deeper. So, are you guys ready for this? Now, where we are in the Milky Way galaxy, that little Orion Spur, there are estimations of hundreds of millions, if not billions of stars in that one small area of the galaxy. Nobody knows for sure, but there are stars of all different sizes, scattered everywhere. Sometimes, a star can go supernova, usually by one of two ways. The star is so massive that the energy it is putting out is just as strong 
as the gravity holding it in. After the star runs out of fuel, it cools down and can no longer hold up against its own gravity, and the core collapses in on itself, fast. So fast that when this happens, the shock wave causes the outer shell to explode. This leaves behind a very dense core and a nebula of gases. This is one way a star goes supernova. Another way this can happen is you have a binary system where one of the stars is a white dwarf and the white dwarf is a vampire star. That white dwarf could get too close and suck so much energy from the other star that it explodes. Now they say this only occurs about a handful of times, two or three times in the galaxy every century. After the star goes supernova, what is left behind is a super dense and super magnetic star. And it either becomes what we call a neutron star or a black hole. Now a magnetar, think of it as something in between. It collapses, but it doesn't sink into itself creating a black hole. When the white dwarf gets close enough to the larger star, if the larger star is running out of fuel, it then transfers energy to the smaller white dwarf. The smaller star starts to rotate faster. The smaller star increases in mass and then releases a lot of its energy, some of it going back to the original star. The result, the energy levels of the smaller star shrink so low they become a magnetar instead of a black hole. Now, for decades, they have been finding these magnetars. But they didn't know what they were. They still really don't know what they are, only what they can observe and detect. Now as of today, there's around 23 known magnetars that have been detected. Now keep in mind, when they say they detected a signal, that's usually radio waves or microwaves. These are at the very least light particles, which contain Across the electromagnetic spectrum, gamma and x-rays, microwaves, UV and infrared, visible light, radio frequencies, do all of these things travel at the same speed? Probably not. So now let's get into what happened in 2004. Now, on December 27th, 2004, the Earth was hit by an extremely large cosmic blast. Several satellites, including RACI, Integral and SWIFT all detected the blast of gamma and X-rays that completely saturated the detectors of the SWIFT satellite. The blast was so powerful, the energy of the blast ionized part of the Earth's upper atmosphere, causing the magnetosphere to, quote, ring like a bell. And when I say ionized, I mean stripped or burnt up. So this blast of energy was discovered to have come from magnetar SGR 1806-20. SGR meaning soft gamma repeater. Now, magnetars are very dense neutron stars. Just to give you an idea of how dense, one cubic centimeter would be equivalent to about 100 million tons here on Earth. We are talking about a magnetic field billions of times stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth. Now, this wave of energy that hit, scientists believe, was the result of a star quake. And the cracking of the magnetar's crust caused an eruption or explosion of energy across the cosmos. In less than a second, the amount of energy released by the magnetar was more than the sun could release in over 200,000 years. This particular magnetar is located in the constellation of Sagittarius, about 50,000 light years away. And given the scale of the universe, this is quite close to us. And this gives us an idea of how close an exploding star would have to be in order to have a significant effect on the Earth. This was the largest, most powerful explosion ever detected during this age. Now Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. However, there are several scientists that suggest that 
neutrino particles may be able to travel faster than photon light particles. The tachyon is supposed to be the particle that always travels faster than light if it exists, as it is a hypothetical particle. So here is what this all boils down to. And CERN has spent some time figuring this out. When you have an explosion and that energy travels halfway across the galaxy to still have an effect on our planet, because not all particles travel at the same speed, and because they have such a distance to travel, they get further and further away from each other. So what you end up with is waves of particles. And each of these waves of particles will reach us at different times. Understand, folks, that one of the things they are doing at CERN is they are trying to find out exactly what particles are being emitted when you have particle collisions. They want to know exactly what type of particles could be ejected from these stars and what those particles do and how they behave. They are building a list amongst other things. Because once a detector detects certain particles coming from a source in deep space, once we have identified those particles, we can get a pretty good idea of what particles are coming next. Remember, they saw this blast from that star in 2004. That means the explosion actually occurred 50,000 years ago. So are we to assume that some of the energy from the blast is still on its way here? They are also known by another name, pulsars, because the signals received from these objects comes in pattern pulses somewhat similar to a lighthouse as the light rotates. So what you observe is a twinkling or a light flicker. Now what's important here to us is how these now 23 plus gamma repeater objects not only affect our sun and us, but how this energy may affect what could be an inbound star system. Something like a brown dwarf with rotating bodies. Space is not a complete vacuum. It is filled with cosmic dust, gas, and other particles we have yet to identify. There are electromagnetic and gravitational forces out there as well. There are interactions between energy coming from these magnetars and space dust. Nebula gases heat up as a result of this energy. The closest known magnetar to us would be 181048.1-5937 which is approximately 9,000 light years from us in the constellation of Carina, which has been putting out observable X-ray burst. Now our sun is a main sequence star, which is the majority of all stars in our galaxy. They can vary in size and convert hydrogen into helium in their cores, releasing a good amount of energy. In order for fusion to occur, you need a star that is about 80 times the size of Jupiter. Anything smaller would be considered a brown dwarf, about 10 to 80 times the size of Jupiter. Before a star becomes a main sequence star, we have what are called protostars, which are the collecting gases of a forming star, and then a T Tauri star, which resembles main sequence stars, but don't quite have enough pressure to start up fusion. We have red giants, which are dying stars that increase size as the hydrogen fuel runs out. Then they shrink back down into white dwarfs once the fuel runs completely out. There are red dwarfs, which interestingly enough are the most common star in the universe, which have a more stable burning of fuel so they last the longest. Super giants, on the other hand, burn fuel too fast and so their lifespan is much shorter than any other stars and they tend to collapse down into neutron stars once they go supernova and there are wolf rayet stars which have emission lines of nitrogen helium and carbon this is usually due to the final stages of energy bursts after a star has died throughout all of these phases these stars are emitting energy in fireballs, flares, pulses, waves. And if we can detect it, it usually means that the energy is headed in this direction. With all the cosmic dust that surrounds us, if there is an incoming star system or companion star to our sun, we have a problem with incoming gamma rays, x-rays, infrared, and magnetic influence. This is what's happening to the Earth. This is the cause of all the changes occurring inside the planet, the atmosphere, and weather. 
not us. Although it does seem that we are being hit with even more cosmic rays when the skies are not being sprayed, let's keep tabs on what we are spotting out there. Keep the labeling of these objects in mind. At least we should have a better understanding of what they are talking about when these things are presented to us. Although still somewhat of a mystery, we should be able to keep up enough so that we know what to expect when these stars have star quakes, eruptions, or flares. They most will definitely have a noticeable effect on our sun, which is one of the first indicators that an energy wave has blasted our solar system. I have a variety of strange and mysterious topics to cover aside from what is happening in space and this winter should reveal some new things about what our planet is going through. In the meantime, I have other things to go over. Until then, I want to thank you all. Woodward TV has hit 400k subscribers. It could have not been done without your support. So I hope you all enjoy what's coming. And I'll talk to you all in the next episode.